So this time we're going to talk about study documents, protocols, manuals of operations or manuals of procedures, case report forms, and databases. And interestingly, I was just asked a question about data management and databases. Now I'll be honest, I have combined together three hour to hour and a half talks, which means we will not finish at five o'clock today. We actually will finish at five o'clock today, but this lecture will continue on Friday. And in fact, there's a lot of material online for this, and that might be where you're gonna have to go for more of the information. Now remember, you know, my constant theme that your question comes first. So any changes to a study must be reflected in study documents. Not two years later, but soon. All study personnel, including your statistician, need to be trained on all study procedures. If your statistician says they don't need to know that, go find yourself another statistician, folks. I'm serious, because some people will say, like, I don't need to know what's going on. But in order for them to do the proper analysis and to make sure that they understand how to handle that they did a good job with your power and sample size calculation, what, and your data manager needs to really understand what data you're collecting and when and how, they need to know everything going on. Some of the most important things I have learned, I learned how to pipette. I learned, I sat in the clinic and watched them do their glucose clamps. I sat down and watched all the study procedures and I found areas where there was variability that I had not accounted for. I figured out how they were actually collecting the data versus what they said they were doing to collect the data. And what I also found out is because of that, there was actually a different variance on the outcome that we had not accounted for and I had to go back and re-estimate that sample size. So everybody, Absolutely everybody should read your protocol, your manuals. I'll be honest, when I don't understand the protocol, I read the informed consent because at least I should understand that. And if I don't understand that, everything has to stop because then nobody's gonna understand anything. So make everybody read everything. You will find a lot of inconsistencies. Please read it before it shows up on my desk if you apply to me for funding because I do not like being a proofreader, although that is about 40% of my job sometimes. So what are our objectives for this lecture? I want you to be able to define the several different parts of a protocol document, manuals of procedures, and case report forms. I also want you to identify resources to assist in the development of study documents and databases. I'm going to give you a whole list of resources, including a new one that Via Cruz is putting forward this week. Some folks are getting training on the bioform. And so this is a new electronic case report form system. And it's actually very similar. I know that there are groups here in Brazil that use REDCAP, which is out of Vanderbilt University, and the CTSA, the Clinical Translational Science Program at the NIH. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So what is an application to get funding versus a protocol versus a MOP, which is sometimes called a MOO, which is a Manual of Procedures. An application for funding or for approval to do work, the type of thing you submit to the Institutional Review Board many times, this typically will actually limit the number of pages you have to describe your research. It is a concise justification and design of a clinical study. However, when you get to the protocol, there is no page limit on a real protocol. This is the document that lives and lets everybody understand how to do your study. This is a detailed plan, no page limits. Now many times I'll also have a manual of operations and procedures. So depending on which letter combination you like, people call them lots of things. This is very finely detailed. A lot of times they're standard operating procedures. Very finely detailed information describing the conduct and operation of a clinical trial. These are vital if you are doing a multi-site study where certain institutions may have variations in the protocol. This MOP is like, this is exactly how you send the blood 
to the central lab. This is exactly, and when I say exactly, this is how you draw it. This is, you know, it's a purple top tube. You do this, you do that. This is how it's labeled. Every single tiny step. You know, basically, any intelligent, careful 17-year-old should be able to run your study. All right, I know they need privileges and training. What? No, they should be able to run your study by following the manual of operations and procedures. I, as your statistician, should be able to do every single last task in your study if I have this mop. So what are your time frames? Well, your application, you have to submit you know, either for funding or if it's going to your institutional review board, you've got to submit there. The protocol sometimes gets submitted with those applications. Many times it's an appendix for certain applications, but it needs to be finalized before you accrue anybody. If you apply to NCAM, to the National Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine, many times we require you to finalize your protocol within the first year of funding. But that varies depending on where you are. The MOP, you have to have finalized prior to accrual. But these last two documents, your protocol and the manual of procedures, these are living documents. Anybody can figure out how decisions were made, how the data was collected, how the data was analyzed. So you've got an attachment to that MOP is going to be your statistical analysis plan. Like there's lots of information that's going in here. So if I die, Paul can run my analysis. That's the way these things are written. Studies are gonna vary. Some people say, I just want a single extremely detailed protocol. That's okay. Other studies want to have both documents. If you have both, they must agree, folks. In a multi-site study, again, some institutions have protocol requirements, others do not. When you see this type of issue, that's where these MOPs become really, really helpful. If you have very complicated or long procedures, again, the manual of operating procedures may be more useful. But please, 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 do not have people randomizing at different points in the study, depending on whether they read your protocol or whether they read your MOP. Case report forms, also called CRFs, versus databases. People get these confused, so I want to be clear as to what they are. Case report forms are where you record the study data. Sometimes they're called eCRFs, or electronic case report forms. This is when you use electronic data capture. One trick about electronic case report forms, sometimes they send data directly into a database, and sometimes they don't. Your data must get into a database. So what is database? The database is that fundamental data management system for the study. And in this case, sometimes I have data management that involves scheduling folks. Sometimes it involves project management, procurement. But a lot of times, you also have to remember, it's got to include those study data. It's got to include all that data that came in, that they were eligible, all their baseline data, all the adverse events that they have, all of that information. Now, a lot of times we use linked databases. So there are multiple databases for a single study. This can be very useful in a longitudinal study. So then I can clean, when everybody's finished baseline and they're all going all the way through, I can clean and lock all my baseline data. And then when they're all done with month three, then I can clean and lock month three data. And that can help us more quickly go through and have the data ready for all of the analyses at the end of a study. Now, what is this database used for? A lot of times people confuse databases and data sets. Data set is created from the database and use the data set to do the analyses. Now, sometimes I will actually, the way my statistical programs work, I call data from different parts and different databases to actually do the analysis but it depends on how sophisticated you're gonna be. So study protocols. 
Again, the whole concept here is somebody can replicate the study. So I have a study that came in and they wrote a very nice paper, these folks had, and my investigator came in and wanted to replicate the work. So they talked to the previous investigator who said, that's great, and got their protocols. They had three publications, three, in peer-reviewed literature. And so they try to write their protocol for the study that we're funding. And I get this phone call. They say, we have a problem. Can we have a conference call? Can we conference you in here? And I'm like, OK, what's going on? Yeah, they couldn't actually figure out how to write and rewrite this protocol. They said there's so many gaps, they couldn't figure out, even after multiple attempts, how to rerun the study. It's very tempting to try to do all of this inside your own little group. But all of you are a team. Hopefully you've networked more this week. You're going to finish doing that by Friday and keep up all of those works and all these contacts. Get your friend to read your protocol. Get your partner to read your protocol. For a long time, so my cousin is a romance book writer. Yeah, very close to statistics and science. But she knows how to write, and she knows how to carry a plot, she knows how to not drop loose ends. So for a long time, I made my cousin read everything for me, because she's like, well, where's this? Because I might fill in the blank, because I know what I want to do, but she wasn't going to miss that, because she didn't know. Like, it, it had to all be on there. I pick on the 17-year-olds, but that's because they pick on us, right? So it's good. Like, Try, you want someone who's very logical, who's going to be like, wait, 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 what happened there? Get these type of people involved to help proofread your documents when you think they're done. I personally recommend that you have one stop document for all study needs. Because when something's going wrong, they do not want to flip to 20 different places to try to figure out where the answer is. There's a problem with this, which means that you may have information in several different places, so they don't have to refer back to section 6.2 to find out what they're supposed to do. When you change the document, you have to change it in every single place. You will have a lot of protocol amendments, it happens, but the problem is you have to amend the protocol everywhere. Or else, again, you're randomizing people at different points in time in your study, depending on where I read. That's not a good thing. So last November, I'm reading, and I see the spirit statement. This is now one of my favorite overall documents ever. If you read the version that got published, I have to say it was actually in BMJ, I think. Maybe it was Lancet. But anyway, so just like the consort, it got republished in a lot of different places. The spirit statement is the standard protocol items, recommendations for interventional trials. This thing is about 47 pages long. Very tiny font, very tiny print. So good, so much information. That document is an entire course in clinical research. It gives lots of examples of text, Lots of examples of things that can and cannot go wrong and how you should address them. Even if you are doing a non-interventional study, I think the elements that are in this protocol document, this template, are excellent. So I highly recommend you go there. Unfortunately or fortunately, at the same time, the unit I work in at NCAM and our Office of Clinical Regulatory Affairs our investigators for several years asked for a research toolbox. They wanted templates for protocols, for manuals of procedures, common case report forms, things like that. We kept saying, go talk to your institution. Other places have this online. We gave up and we made our own. So we are proud of this. It is constantly being revised. You're welcome to go to our link. Everything is publicly available in our toolbox. We have a lot of examples, and we reached out across the NIH to pull a lot of this information together. St. George's University of London is also one of my favorite sites. These folks have put together a statistics guide for research grant applicants. 
and it changes over time, so they have both a guide and a checklist because they got tired of reviewing applications that did not have the necessary information. What they say you need, probably everyone will say that you need. And some of the better examples for what not to put in as the sample size justification is sitting on those two links. So what is a study protocol? The protocol is really the roadmap for the performance of your study. Here you're supposed to anticipate problems and put down your plans for action. It facilitates the communication with your potential collaborators, employers, and funding agencies. This is your telling me exactly what you're going to do, not just the big concept idea. And also, this is going to assist a lot in your manuscript preparation. I'm serious because five years later, seven years later, even a year and a half later, you forget. And so you can go back to these documents and you've already written big chunks of your manuscript many times. It's sitting in this protocol. So what are the components? We're going to go through each one of these. We're going to go through the first four. We're going to talk about specific objectives, background and rationale, a concise statement of design, and the selection and enrollment of participants. Now, some of these elements I'm going to cover a little bit more when we talk about the MOP. So I'm going to kind of go skip around. That doesn't mean you should have less. It means we only have so much time. So a statement of design. An observational study of decline in pulmonary function in persons living in heavily industrialized areas compared to persons in non-industrialized areas. What do we know here? Is this a randomized study? Raise your hand if you think it is. Correct, see, you're gonna do great on that exam, I told you. So it's an observational study. I'm comparing people that were in non-industrial areas to people in heavily industrial areas. So I'm comparing an exposure and a non-exposure group. And I'm comparing them on pulmonary function. Now there are a lot of ways you can measure pulmonary function, but I have a pretty good idea in one sentence about what's going on here. Deficits, sure, but it's a reasonable statement. A prospective non-concurrent study of post-operative pneumonia and patients receiving regional versus general anesthesia for peripheral vascular grafting. Well, while I personally would prefer that this was a randomized study, I can tell it's prospective, so they're looking forward in time. I can tell it's non-randomized. And I can see who are my patients. I don't know everything. I don't know where they are. I don't know how old they are. But I have a general idea. These actually might be from St. George's now that I'm thinking about it. So what's your question of interest? This is something that should be really clear. Remember, we went through these on the first day. When I read that statement, I should have a very good idea of where you're going with the question that you have. Design. When you're trying to write in your protocol and in all of these documents, in that first front area, it needs to be really clear, not only what is your design, but is it the appropriate study design for your study aim? So I want to be really clear, what is the overall design? What are your objectives? What are your aims? And does it make sense? Now, one question that comes up a lot is uh, what you learn in most classes, and even thinking about some of the sample size lecture today, and I think where some confusion came up, is people think about this phase three design framework. They think about efficacy. Not everything has to be in that framework, and Paul was trying to describe that, you know, maybe 60% power is okay. Maybe an alpha of 0.1 is okay. You have to actually just say and defend what adaptation is necessary. What are we trying to do? There are a wide variety of question-appropriate designs sometimes, and so you have to justify why you're choosing one or the other. There's some work by David Madigan out of Columbia University in New York. And he actually talks about, and they think they're now publishing out of OMAP, why certain, they took one set of study data and they basically simulated a variety of different study designs that they could have done. And they found very different results. So they said, you know, you really have to think about these little tiny decisions that we make 
can really drive our study results. So you need to really defend why you've made it. You know, you don't have to be defensive, but you do need to not just state it and walk away. So let's think about participant enrollment. You must have people in your study. Let me be clear, I can do a lot of magic with data, but I cannot make data magically appear. You need to, in your enrollment procedures, one, which is actually not on here, maintain a screening log. You want to know why people are not making it into your study. And don't just start, stop, like first time, first thing that they are excluded that you stop. You want to know, you know, would they've been excluded for one reason only or 20? Because while I would rather that you never, never change your inclusion exclusion criteria, I get probably four requests a week asking for approval of changes to those criteria. And I'm going to ask you for evidence. Who are you screening out? And if you make this change, how many people will now be able to come in? And then also I'm going to say, should they be in? What's the scientific impact of allowing this change? That's the reason beforehand you need to lay out how are you going to identify and recruit people for your study? Where are you going to go recruit them? Some locations are going to force you to have additional approvals. All of your advertising, all of this stuff has to be approved typically by an institutional review board, sometimes by other groups too. How will you document ineligibility and non-participation of your eligible candidates? Somebody's eligible for your study, but they don't participate. How do you document this? How do you, def how do you even make the decision in the first place? Some teams have a team meeting once a week. Other teams do it all automatically on the fly. How you set up your case report forms can lead to a lot of either missed, missed inclusion or missed exclusion. So you need to be careful that you do this in a really nice manner, and I'll show you some examples of that probably on Friday. You want to define your consent procedure. We'll talk more about that. And also define a randomization procedure if it's applicable. Whoops. So good? OK. So what about inclusion criteria? Inclusion criteria, define your patient population as specifically as possible. The inclusion criteria, you need to have a way of defining the disease or condition under study. If that's what you're doing. You say prior myocardial infarction, how do you define that? How do you operationalize that? If we took six people in this room, would they all make the same decision that that participant should be in your study? Smokers, again, exactly how are you defining it? Someone that stopped smoking 15 years ago? How, is it four packs a day? How do you count that? Is it the person who just smokes on the weekends where they're at the bar with their friends? What's a smoker? Other information, age. I do see people put age restrictions when really what they want are people who are not well to not be in their study. Like, oh, well, when they get over the age of 60 or 65, they're on so many medications, they've got all these problems. And I was like, well, then exclude the medications and exclude the problems because they could have those at 50 or they could be perfectly healthy at 80. And you know, what is it you really, really care about? Sex. And how are you going to define it? Not everybody is XX or XY. You've got to think about this. Do you care about gender? Do you care about sex? And how much do you care? Area of residence or hospitalization. All sorts of different things. Do you have required laboratory results? Where are those coming from? How accurate are they? How much do you care? What about the ability to understand and comply with procedures? If all your case report forms are in Portuguese and you have somebody who does not speak or read Portuguese, what are you gonna do? If you give them all written consent, all written forms, all written forms they have to fill out, it's self-report and they don't read, is that okay? You need to think about what it takes to be in your study, but also what allowances you can make to make the most broad general group available for your study. So I have case report forms that are translated into 14 different languages. But if somebody's running that yoga class only in English and doesn't speak another language, they're not gonna understand the instruction, I have a problem. So you have to think about what it takes to actually run all the way through your study. 
Now, I have to admit, I usually try to make my PIs be patient zero. I make them run through so they understand you know, how they're supposed to be answering these questions. You know, what is it, like, can you actually go get your blood drawn? Oh, now that you've filled out four hours worth of forms, maybe you want to reduce your patient burden or participant burden. So exclusion criteria. This is a straight line, folks. Participants must not have any of the specified criterion. Generally, you include conditions that, again, are going to make this study difficult or impossible. Now, you don't want to say, so this would have, so, does speak Portuguese, does not speak Portuguese. Like, you know, you wanted it either in your inclusion or in your exclusion. Don't make them overlap. But your potential study participants, and this is coming up on our lecture on Friday, where the patients in whom one treatment or the other is going to be inappropriate or unethical, you do not want them in your study, you want them excluded. Or you need to have a design such that they can only be forced into the arms where it is ethical for them to be in. You don't want to knowingly be causing harm to folks. Because me, as a statistician, I have programmed a computer to randomize people. I assume if they get through your inclusion exclusion criteria, I can randomize them anywhere I want. So this really matters. And in fact, in the coronary artery surgery study, they excluded patients with left main coronary artery disease. There was an issue because they, in fact, could not go into some of the arms of the study. So there are various examples that come up as to when you only send people in different directions. But it's difficult, and you have to think about it. Safety of your participants is the primary concern here. This is why you're setting up these inclusion-exclusion criteria, but in particular, exclusion criteria. It's not just performance and the intervention. I do studies with MRIs. So if somebody has some device that does not allow them to get an MRI, they need to be excluded from my study because they can't have that measure taken. And it matters. So then we have the, what I will call, legal logistic concerns. You may have somebody who's under age 18. In many countries, that means that you have to have both consent from a parent or guardian and assent, depending on the age of the younger participant. The critically ill, you have to think about their ability to participate, their ability to consent, and what you're going to allow. This was an issue in my Huntington's disease study. This is a neurodegenerative disease, and part of what we decided we had to require was to have a, an available caregiver who was their healthcare proxy and could help make sure that they, in fact, were also taking all of their intervention, get them back and forth to their sessions for the study. Circumstances that might make determination of the outcome difficult or impossible even. A lot of times I will include section to say, are you leaving the area? Do you plan to move within the next 18 months? It is surprising how many people sign up for a study and yet plan to go to grad school in six months and the study lasts for a year. And they're not going to grad school anywhere close. So you do many times want to ask this question. Now sometimes people say, no, just fly them in, do whatever you need to do. But this also becomes a discussion. People need to understand what their participation is going to entail and are they or are they not willing to actually participate? Again, this language issue comes up, and pregnancy. So depending on the tests that are going to be run, and the interventions, and the local rules, you may or may not want to exclude for pregnancy, not exclude for pregnancy or breastfeeding. You may want to ask, is it that you are going to be planning to become pregnant or impregnating anybody? This is my personal fight. A lot of people think that pregnancy only involves women. They seem to forget they get pregnant somehow. And if I'm giving a natural product to a male participant and he impregnates a woman, there may or may not be implications for that fetus. This is something to really consider, and a lot of studies don't. A lot of studies will talk only about women and not about men. Now, another thing to consider is, you know, can you actually do a urine test, and when do you need to do it, or do you need to do a blood test if you're trying to check on pregnancy? 
these are things that come up, and it's not just at baseline, but it can also be something that is an issue throughout the study. So again, in some of my imaging studies, we actually do need to test for pregnancy repeatedly throughout the study because we want to know before we throw them in the scanner and give them all that contrast and other stuff. Now, somebody had a question in the back, or were you just stretching? All right, can we give her a microphone? So I, I have a, a conceptual uh, doubt concerning uh, inclusion and the exclusion criteria, because uh, all you presented here, in my mind, they are cr uh, criteria of not including patients in the, in the protocol. So what I think is that when we include uh, uh, a patient in the protocol, the, the, cr the criteria for exclude, they are quite different. So, for example, there is somebody that uh, uh, in, my stud in my study, I do not expect to have pregnant uh, women. Then I include a woman and uh, a woman, and after that he became pregnant. So she'll be excluded from my study. Ah. So how to interpret, how to, to, to interpret these uh, this, uh, names, you know, these okay. concepts of inclusion, exclusion, or not I included? I think I've got that, yeah. All right, so I, I'm actually going to answer two questions out of what I think was just your one question. So I agree with Dr. Grady, I believe, he's talked about this yesterday, or maybe it was on Monday. The key way I tend to think about studies is everybody should be included until you start excluding them for very specific reasons. So sometimes people try to set very specific inclusion criteria and then also separately exclusion criteria. And while it is important if you're looking at a very specific disease or very specific population, you might have that in your inclusion criteria. But a lot of times I think we underestimate who could potentially be in our studies. And so starting at the very inclusive and then saying, okay, who do we have to exclude for various reasons is one way to go. But your question is more, all right, they got through my initial screening for inclusion exclusion and now they're violating one of these exclusion criteria. Did I get that correct? All right. So what tends to happen, it depends on the study, and that's something you need to put into your protocol. It's actually coming up here pretty soon, I think. And sometimes you decide that, in fact, what is the element you need to think about? Is it that a certain testing procedure might harm them? In which case, you may continue them on the protocol, but just not do that test. So I might stop doing the MRIs, but continuing measuring everything else because that's safe. It might be that one of the interventions is unsafe, in which case you have to make a determination. Again, do you take them, if they're on that intervention, do you take them off, but continue to collect the data? As Paul talked about, you know, one part that we will say for an intent to treat is keep measuring those folks. And in fact, depending on what's happened, you may be under an obligation to continue watching them at least for safety effects. So there is that part. Now sometimes, you know, I sometimes have patients that are highly suicidal in some of my studies. And it is no longer safe either for my study staff or for that study participant to be a part of the study. And then we actually will withdraw them from the study. But there are a lot of ways to handle this, and it's very situation specific. But some of the easy ones that you should be thinking about are, you know, if somebody becomes pregnant and that's going to have a problem, you can write that in your protocol up front. That's an easy thing to foresee that could happen. One thing that really helps when you're writing these documents is think about everything that could happen. And then once you run one study and you learn the 20 other things that could have happened that you never anticipated and that you solved, you're going to start writing all these protocol amendments and start writing additional operating procedures for your studies, and you're going to incorporate those into all your future studies. You will see more and more papers that are written now that sometimes, like, this is what my protocol is. So they kind of publish out, this is what my study is going to be, my study design. And then the afterwards, which is, this is all the stuff I learned that I wish I'd known before. So start reading those papers, and I encourage people to publish them. One, it gets a publication out. 
But two, we need to share this knowledge across all of us as investigators and really help people solve these problems also in a more consistent manner. Oops. So I think hopefully I've answered your question and I'm gonna move on to defining the interventions and definitions. So interventions. I sometimes get protocols and they go on for pages and pages about the intervention that is experimental and of interest to them and it says something, and then we have a placebo control. Or, you know, then we have usual care control. What is that? Like, you know, I need more of a sentence. What is it made of? Where was it manufactured? Like, is there, sometimes it's this huge health education program that goes on for 12 weeks, and I have two sentences. What are you talking about when? Who runs it? So everything you talk about for interventions, you talk about for every single intervention. If it's a waiting list, well, how are you interacting with them? Were they waiting for what? So talk about the dose, the quality, the preparation of the product, or if you have an intervention that is staff-based, maybe it's a psychological intervention or a behavioral intervention. How are you training all those leaders? Who are they? What is the administration and reproducibility of all of these interventions? What is not only their training going in, but the training throughout the study? How are you doing quality control of that drug throughout the study? Is it under IND? Is it under some type of regulatory guidance? In which case, talk about that. What are the participant implications? What happens when they take this, and what do you all need to be looking for? We'll talk a lot about that because of concomitant interventions. What's allowed? Can they take aspirin, or do they have to take acetaminophen? What's required? Are they required to take it with something? And what is prohibited? So one of my studies, I think I talked about the light box study. They cannot take any photosensitizing medications. So let's say there's some antibiotics that you're not supposed to be out in the sun with. They're two weeks into the study, they get sick, their doctor tells them to take this drug, what do you do? You have to have plans for this and you can have them in advance. But also if you tell most people a photosensitizing medication, they don't know what that is. You wanna give them a list of common names that they may see and tell them it's really important. You need to go to your doctor with this list if, when you're going and call us. Usually there's a safety monitor. That also helps you with these inclusion exclusion issues that happen after the fact. And many times your safety monitor can help you interpret a lot of issues and come up with solutions for these interventions. But yeah, con med is what they're usually called, but people think about medications it can be a lot more than medication. If you're on a psychological intervention and they start another psychological intervention, that might matter. So what about safety? People forget to collect data on safety, and we're gonna hear more about that over the next day, but you wanna collect all information, you want to record all information in a very precise, systematic format. There are lots of international ways that you can try to record this. Choose one for your study. Let me know what you're using. If you're on oncology, there's a common toxicity criteria that's used worldwide. If you are in, you know, there's a WHO criteria. There's one used by pharma. There are tons of them. Choose one. But you also want to report information, and you need to put down what is considered reportable to whom do you need to report it, and within what time frame do you need to report it? But this is the trick, is that people somehow think that only items that are listed as reportable actually need to be recorded, and this is wrong. You must record everything to deal with safety. Because what you expect to happen might happen at an unexpected rate, or it might be more severe, or you might get lucky, it may be less severe, and now you have a new potential outcome to be looking at. But if you have depressed patients and they commit suicide, you say, well, sometimes they do that. I have patients who have a high fall risk and they fall, sometimes they do that. But your intervention may be causing them to fall more. And that is what you try to pick out here. And if you do not collect, and record and have someone like Paul or I analyze that data to check it to see if something looks a little weird, you will never know that you may now have a reportable adverse event. 
So also not all about study participants. So for a couple, for about a year or so, I was acting director of our Office of Clinical Regulatory Affairs. During that time, my BlackBerry was always fully charged. And I, one morning, I wake up on Saturday with this thing buzzing. I was like, OK, what's going on? And it's from one of my program officers. And it turns out that somebody trying to go into the study had attempted to kill somebody who was running the study. And so <laughs> she's like, what do I do with this? And I said, well, yeah, so you have to plan for a lot of safety and figure out what you're going to do about a lot of things. So protocol components. Back to now methods, procedures. We're going to go through a lot of this. Again, this is a very quick overview of a very set, deep, deep set of topics, all of which could be discussed on their own. You need a schedule of evaluations, folks. I want to know exactly who is coming in when and the distance between the time they're being evaluated and what those evaluations entail. From the very first time you start trying to talk to them to the very end of when you are done. You also want an overall study timeline. You want to think about this because it impacts your ability to perform the study. The timeline for individual study participants because that impacts the people who want to participate. And when you start laying it out, you may want to start missing major holidays in Brazil, for example. You may want to start missing holidays in the other countries where you are doing research. You need to start thinking, because remember I talked about you know, the ladies who were trying to go to their child's weddings and drink when they were on a strict feeding and alcohol study? You have to think about this. Also, does your participant want to participate for 18 months? Think about it from their perspective, not just your own. But also the overall study timeline. Sometimes people realize, by the time I spend six months to a year, maybe if you're fast, three months, getting my study documents together and approvals together, and then I recruit, and it's going to take me four, five, six years to recruit, because maybe I need another site to do my recruitment at. Oh, and then those statisticians will work for free because I ran out of money a long time ago. And they can analyze that data in like two weeks, right? You have to really think, can I do the study in the amount of time I have? Is it still going to even be relevant by the time I can finish it? This is also part of that hidden part that Paul talked about with your sample size. This is very hard to see, but if you look at our protocol template, you can see it nice and pretty. This is the type of assessment. I've got screening visit. Screening can happen between day 14 and 1. We zero out day 0 at baseline. If they pass their baseline, they get enrolled, and then they get randomized. And they will receive their first treatment that day. Treatment 2 was in week 1. And actually, if you look at our final follow-up visit, when you actually read the full protocol, there's a window on a lot of these. And it tells me at every single visit, what are they doing? They're signing informed consent. I get their demographics. They have a DEXA scan. I'm taking medical histories, doing a general physical examination, getting a list of all their current medications. I have a panel of blood chemistries. I've got a whole bunch of stuff listed. You know, this is the type of chart you want. And I want it very, very specific. All your outcome definitions need to be as specific and clear as possible. You want to define those primary and secondary outcomes and any exploratory outcomes that you're looking at, any other assessments. I'll be honest, standard clinical definitions from your textbooks are not usually specific enough. Sometimes people will use a consensus conference, so they define, this is how we are defining hypertension. It may be for outcomes. This can also be part of your inclusion-exclusion criteria. What is some recognized expert body? What do they have to say about it? This also comes up back when you're trying to write later on, and you have to defend why you chose certain definitions. You want something you can cite, not just your decision, as was brought up earlier today. It needs to be something that a lot of people would recognize. That makes sense. That's why you would want to cut it. However, for a lot of tools, those cuts can vary and change over time. So as many of my studies in the United States as we're switching from DSM-4 to DSM-5, 
lot of my studies are impacted and they had to make a decision should they, as they were waiting for DSM-5 to come out, so I have a lot of psych studies in case you didn't figure that out, but they were saying, okay, do we wait, do we delay an extra six months to a year to be able to use DSM-5 or do we run under DSM-4, hope that we're not going to have major changes and just say, you know, we, ex we expect that the community, the scientific community, will kind of give a pass for the first five to ten years that we could be under either one. So use those outcome definitions. Sometimes we also do something called adjudication. So adjudication means you might have a panel of masked, unbiased, supposed experts. We dealt with this a lot, um, especially dealing with like radiology. So an oncology would send stuff out and have a blinded radiologist look and make a determination. Although a lot of those criteria that get used, there's a big bunch of unknown, cannot classify. You're gonna have to figure out how you classify them when you analyze the data. So think through all of this. What about measurement? Remember that little ruler I had on Monday? You do have to think about what is the difference that's scientifically important. Is it gonna be 0.01 inches? Is it 10 millimeters of mercury in systolic blood pressure? What is it for your study question that matters? How variable are your measurements? And you can pilot this. You know, piloting really, really matters. If that measuring tape is gonna keep stretching out, you're not going to have really great measures by the end of your study. When you get on a scale and you try to weigh people, you need to make sure that that scale stays calibrated. So there's actually a lot of practical considerations for effective sample size determination by Russ Linth. It's a nice article, and he describes a lot of issues about measurement. When you're choosing measures, you need to be sensitive to the magnitude of the change that you are expecting. Don't try to measure something that you can't actually measure. You want to be specific to the changes expected in your outcome based on the study hypothesis. Now, sometimes people ask, well, does the outcome measure, did it always have to have been used? Should I use the HAMD, for example? Should I use a type of instrument that's been used over and over again? That may not be the case. Now, if you use a brand new instrument, you probably want one that everybody already knows and understands along with it. But just like we have to grow science, we have to grow outcome measures. Not all outcome measures are great. You know, a lot of these outcome measures, especially in depression, they were developed in the 1950s on inpatient populations. They're frankly really not useful today. So what are we going to do? Well, you can develop new measures, but in the meantime, everybody's used to using those old measures, so you probably want both in your study, and then you can make that transition over time. But you do need to preferably, in your patient population for the study, have some idea of how useful and reliable and valid the measures are. So do you have good information? Can you afford your outcome measure? I have people that are like, oh, I know I'm supposed to do three cortisol measurements, but I can't afford it anymore because they have brought up 10 times now to run my cortisol. The cost went up tenfold. She's like, I can't run it. I have to do one cortisol measurement. Except that's not going to publish well. So we're like, well, you've got to think about this. Cost is important, but it doesn't mean that it's good. The highest cost is not the best, and the lowest cost is not the worst. So just think, you know, think about your measures, think about what you need, and think about what you need next. Might not be your primary outcome today, but it could be your primary outcome tomorrow. As we're developing outcome measures, so I've devoted more than 10 years of my life to developing a set of outcome measures, it is not easy if you do it the correct way. But you also have to think. Sometimes people say, well, this doesn't look the same as the gold standard. It's like, well, if it was gold, I wouldn't have been developing a new measure. So you have to think about this. Person reported outcomes is a huge area right now. So the self-report measures or observer reported measures. But you also have tremendous biomarker development that's going on. 
as you're thinking about it, think about the instrumentation that can be used, the interpretations. How are people going to understand your instruments? What is the guidance that you're going to give? If your entire study is based on developing a new outcome measure, is a completely different study than trying to compare drug A to drug B. Although a lot of these elements, a lot of the understanding is still the same. But if you are developing a person reported outcome, here's my 30 second lecture. Think about multiple languages up front. Think about different cultures. Think about the lifespan. I will tell you my new study th or my new theme for talks is not what is the question, but think Sesame Street. Three year olds to six year olds and countries around the world understand Sesame Street. And if you want to make something that is understandable and that 60 year olds also understand and are okay with, try to deliver all of your information like it would be delivered on Sesame Street. Different patient populations, you want to think broadly. If you develop an instrument only in people who have osteoarthritis, and it's a physical functioning instrument, you could have probably developed that in a much broader patient population. It will probably not be all that much more work, and you will be much more useful with what you have developed. So think broad, think young, and think Masking and blinding, you have to address this in your protocol. Specify the people that will be masked, why they are masked, how you are going to accomplish this, and what is going to be masked. At the very least, you can probably mask your endpoint assessment. You need to assess masking. You need to assess not only the study participants if they are masked, but also the study staff if they are masked. Several folks that I talk to in regulatory say that they want to have an assessment of the blinding or the masking early in the study so that it's not as strongly impacted by outcomes. So a lot of times when I do see masking reviews, it actually happens at the very end of study. But many of the regulators now feel while that's reasonable, it's driven too much by study outcome. I will say that consort used to ask for an assessment of masking and then took that out because it is actually a very difficult thing to do. Pre-plan up front how you're going to actually test for the masking. But again, as I said earlier this week, need to know basis. If you're gonna have a mask study, even if something needs to become unblinded, that doesn't mean the information has to go very far. And it is in fact considered something that is usually reportable if someone who was supposed to be blinded becomes unblinded. So check and find out what's going on. It is not the worst thing in the world. Now somebody else said, does this mean my entire study has to stop and the world has come to an end? I'm like, no, not necessarily, but try hard. Random allocation, you have to describe your allocation procedure and you must describe the amount of time all of these elements take. Who allocates people to the study group? One time someone tried to have absolutely everybody blinded in the study. I'm like, well, somebody has to know who's getting what. You know, <laughs> someone has to know. But you have to actually define which of all those randomization techniques or more are you going to use? Who's going to do it? But exactly. Somewhere, it does not need to be in the protocol exactly, like a general part needs to be in the protocol, but somewhere someone needs to be able to replicate and audit that randomization. I ran an auditing contract, and yes, I did make my auditor sit down and make sure that people had been put into the correct study arm and that they were pulling this off correctly and not sneaking Aunt Sally into the arm that they wanted her on. Stratifying or balancing or matching, in your allocations, verify that data before assignment. There's a classic um, problem that happened at MD Anderson Hospital where in fact people typed in the wrong information and the people were allocated to the wrong study arm. Build in checks and have a plan for what you're gonna do if something goes wrong. There is a lot of programming and oversight time to make randomization work well. I will also say, if you're gonna use those sealed envelopes, they are very easy 
to have them be destroyed because they will hold it up to a light like this and figure out what it is. Stay away from the envelopes if you can. You also need to say when exactly people are randomized or allocated. One of my studies, and I place blame on myself for this, not only on myself, but on myself, they randomized people once they finished their baseline assessment. I was naive and thought that this would make sense, but then it turned out, I thought they were putting them all in kind of this bullpen, and then once they had enough people to start their class, that they would randomize everybody to the classes. No, 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 no. They randomized them as they walked out the door. And then it took them three to four months to try to get enough people to be in the class. And then they only ran the class one day a week, and sometimes people couldn't come because of their work schedule. So they said, okay, you can take the next class. So they randomized people, sometimes 18 months before they ever did the intervention. Do not do this, folks. You randomize at the very last minute before they start their intervention. You need to put into your protocol the maximum length of time allowed between not only screening and baselining, but baselining and randomization, and then randomization and starting the intervention. After what point do I need to re-baseline, folks? At what point do I need to double check that they're still eligible for my study if they haven't actually started that intervention yet? All this type of information is needed in non-randomized studies too. You don't want them to call. They saw, you know, you saw those pretty signs in Beatrice's talk today. You don't want to get somebody to call your study, say they're interested, and then you don't get back in touch with them for six months. Don't do that. You need to have written into your protocol all of the timing steps, because once it's down there, you and your study staff will stick to it a lot better. I'm just gonna keep talking and assume that you're gonna raise your hands if you have questions, because I'll be honest, most of this is, is pretty just churning, as Paul said. And y'all are probably tired. So if you have questions, raise your hand and someone will go running with a microphone. Okay, does that sound good? And we'll just go to five o'clock and then call it a day. Is that okay? All right, nobody says no, so I guess we're good. So randomization reminders. Too early, you have trouble. <laughs> Don't actually randomize when you say you have a randomized study. Pro tip, people do not run into your study randomly. They do not come knock on your door and say, that's just random, who shows up when? That is not randomization, folks. That is not a randomized study. You need to say, if you're doing a randomized study, it needs to be an actual randomization method involved. Basic principles are important here. We're trying to minimize that bias of allocating people to the, each study arm. If the method of randomization used does not accomplish that task, or if it can be easily undermined by holding something up to the light, you have to really consider if you have a problem. You need to have a section on your statistical considerations. General study design issues, you tend to describe the treatment assignment, the randomization procedures, interim analyses, stopping rules, data analyses. You know, is it gonna be an intent to treat? Is it a per protocol? So when I talk about population here, I'm talking about the population of data that will be analyzed. Yes, ma'am, and I guess they have to get you a mic, so I'm gonna keep talking until we get a microphone down here. Sample size. The specific analysis to answer each hypothesis needs to be clear and appropriate for the study design. Why not use a two-sided test? This is where you defend your one-sided test. Yes, ma'am. Just one question. Uh, if you specify in the protocol all your randomization methods, methods you're going to use for randomization. Are you gonna say, am I gonna have people figure out the randomization? Yeah, so this is why in the protocol, you may have some information, but things like the seed, that's a separate document that is locked away somewhere else. So let me be clear, you know, the protocol will say, and then the statistician has in his safe, blah, blah, blah. So the protocol should let me know who to go talk to, that that's the guy down there, and this is his email and phone number, and here's the backup person 
to contact. But yeah, like, you know, I would say that I'm using permuted block randomization. I'm not going to say, I'm doing this and I'm using R version blah, blah, blah with seed blah, blah, blah that I'm going to do it and here are all of my exact block sizes. So, so it is, so there is enough information that somebody knows how to go and find it for replication, okay? No, no, I would not typically, I get mad at my investigators if they put the block size in the protocol, but the block size should be somewhere else, okay? But I should know where that somewhere else is, all right? So sample size, specific analyses, why not the two-sided test? Somebody actually gave me a good example as we were walking back from lunch for a one-sided test, but usually two-sided. Attrition, dropout, missing data, what's expected, how that's impacting your sample size, this should all be documented. You're going to have to deal with multiple comparisons. You need to be really clear how you're handling this, if you're handling it. Oh, okay, another question. Yes? Não, falou sobre o mascaramento e a randomização com os participantes do estudo. Agora, eu queria saber como encarar esse estudo randomizado com o comitê de ética que normalmente exige para a pessoa declarar tudo o que vai fazer na metodologia de estudo com as pessoas, os participantes. Portanto, por exemplo, no meu país exigem isso muito e tem depois supervisores que seguem o estudo no terreno, na execução, na implementação do estudo. So, I'm not 100% sure what your country is going to want, but I will attempt to answer your question, also because I audit studies like that, so I can tell you what I want. There needs to, again, be a place to be able to find that randomization information. You may have to turn it over to a review board, but that does not mean it needs to be sitting in a binder in your study office, okay? So sometimes you have material in multiple places and it has to be provided. Remember that need to know basis? Somebody may need to know it, but not everybody needs to know it. In that study binder in the office, you need to have in there, if you need to know it, this is who you talk to. So if I walked up to Paul and I said, hi, I'm going to now be auditing one of your clinical trials, and you would say, okay, that's a reasonable group I am supposed to turn information over to. And actually, I would tell the principal investigator this is the person who will be doing it. The principal investigator would say, Paul, please turn over the following documents. Please meet with this person individually. The principal investigator is out of it at that point, usually. But it depends on kind of each different institution and review group has a different way they want to do things. I will also say in some places, randomization is not going to be considered ethical. In other places, it is. And so it really does depend on the situation you're working in. Not all studies can be done in all locations. It is important to figure out what is the appropriate study question to ask and to answer and where you can actually do that. Did I interpret the question correctly? I guess for others who listened to it? Okay. All right, and if not, ask me again later and we'll work, the, well, I'll answer it again on Friday. So if you're going to have longitudinal repeated measurements, this has to be part of the sample size. I need to understand how you took that into account. If you're going to have interim analyses, I need to understand that also. Your analysis plan needs to lay out a lot of different information. I can tell when I read a protocol or even an application, if you're working with a good statistician or epidemiologist, I can probably tell you roughly within a five to 10 year period where and when they graduated even. Eventually you read enough of these, you start figuring a few things out and what their degree is in too. Work with them, it's going to show and it will make you go through review faster typically. Clearly express everything. Your data collection forms. 
They should be part of the protocol. It is typically an appendix to them. There's a whole data management plan that needs to be outlined. That also includes quality assurance. Quality assurance needs to be for the training of the study staff, quality control for all these metrics for your outcome measures. How do you capture, document, and review any protocol violations or deviations? If you're going to have site monitoring, as our last questioner just asked about, you know, that's part of this auditing monitoring procedures. How are you going to be double checking that all your sites are actually complying and following that protocol you spent so much time on? How are you going to ensure in a multi-site study or even multi-data collection study that your data is being collected correctly? And how are you going to record all of these reviews and any changes that need to be made? All of this needs to be worked in. It is not nearly as short as these lecture slides. So I'm going to speak briefly about participant rights, confidentiality, authorship, and such. These are elements that should, all that stuff that Christine was talking about yesterday, parts of that actually do show up in your protocol. Earlier to make these, the earlier you make these decisions and understandings, the better. It is everybody's job to participate in the protection of human subjects. It needs to be exquisitely clear in all your study documents how you are monitoring for anything that is going to happen, any adverse effects. You need to talk about how you're going to inform patients, physicians of complications or abnormalities. So when I do these MRIs, I do a structural MRI, they find something. It's an incidental finding. What do we do about that? Is nobody gonna look at that MRI for 17 months? I hope not. You have to have a review of all those labs. If something looks really weird, who's gonna follow up on it? One of my studies, they said they would contact all the physicians if something happened and that was part of what had to get signed and agreed to. Well, a few people opted out of their physicians receiving the information, but the study just proceeded and sent it to everybody's physician. That's a problem. You have to deal with this. So you have to think, do you tell them, do you not? How is this gonna get handled? Interim analyses, again, how are those gonna be handling to look at any issues of human subjects. We're gonna have a talk tomorrow about data monitoring boards and all the other types of monitoring committees. They are part of this role. You need to describe their role, how they're meeting. They will have a separate charter and there will be a separate data monitoring plan that you will be referring to in your protocol. Again, another document that when you make a change in one, you're gonna probably have to make a change in the other. The informed consent, copy of this. Written informed consent or other types of informed consent, you want to talk about how are you going to be doing this consent? What is the review that has to happen? Where is it going to happen? You're going to have some type of number probably listing this. Informed consent is not just a document, it really is an approach. You want to find the proper setting, it tends to be quiet or private if you're doing this in person. There are a lot, actually I should say, there are a lot of better people to tell you this than me. But it is something that should be described, how you're going to consent people should be described in your protocol. You need to allow, when you're trying to plan all those participant visits, you need to allow adequate time to actually go through the consenting process. You need to encourage these potential study participants to discuss with each other, with their family members, with their physicians, to ask questions. You need to ensure that they're competent to give consent. How are you going to determine this? Some of my studies say they are going to give a quiz to, under, to make sure that participants understand this study and their informed consent document. And so I asked, well, what's the passing grade? You know, what, what if it seems when they take this quiz they don't understand? At what point do you not consent them for the study? Like, well, we'll just keep talking to them till they do. And I'm like, Some, I'm not so sure about that. So think about kind of what are the consequences of what you're trying to plan in here. Again, we had the discussion, I think Conepe talked about the, you know, who gets a copy or the original of signed consents. Unblinded studies, are they willing to participate regardless of random assignment? Even in blinded studies, 
This is an issue. Really understanding that they could be randomized to either arm, because a lot of times people will drop out. They want to be in a certain arm. That's why they want to be in the study. Well, what happens? So this is a list of common mistakes. Inadequate time, failure to specify the required procedures, inadequate documentation of the consent process. This is all stuff my auditors pick up on a regular basis, by the way. Vague or inaccurate statements. We go back, we read informed consent, we say, we don't even know what you mean. If we don't know what you mean, how does anybody else know that? Making commitments you can't meet. The use of untruths to protect study design. Now this is something that comes up because sometimes we do deception research, but how you do that is very, very carefully, and there are a lot of rules and regulations around that in every country. Sometimes I see consent forms signed after they needed to have been signed. So you have to really think about your timing, your process, and the recording and documentation of information. And you also have to be careful you don't speak for the patient. That potential participant who's coming in. And this happens, I work a lot in like actual healthcare settings where we're dealing with patients who are becoming participants in human subjects. And this is a very delicate line to be moving back and forth across. So you want to write your protocol so anyone can replicate the study. That's your bottom line. And so later on, we'll talk about the rest of this. And I will see you early tomorrow morning because we're going to talk about survival analysis. And it's hard, but it will be a good lecture, I promise. Take care.